Hello, Marvel United fans. Andrew Fantasia here. Welcome back to Digital Charcuterie as we buckle down for the long, long, long wait until Marvel United Multiverse arrives on our doorstep a year from now. So to make the time go by a little bit faster, we're going to keep on making Marvel United related videos right here on Digital Charcuterie, probably on a tri-weekly basis. I don't know. I don't have the schedule worked out any kind of science, but we're going to pass the time together and have some fun. As usual, if you enjoyed this video and you have a good time here, please feel free to give some love to the subscribe button, click the like button, do all that fun stuff so that you're notified as soon as we drop new MU videos. And hey, if you think I'm okay and you find me entertaining at all, then maybe I would suggest checking out my self-published fantasy series, which you can get on Amazon right now. It's called We Were Wizards. If you're a fan of fantasy and adventure, and just some romping, stomping, good fun. Do people still say romping, stomping? I don't know. I'm pretty out of touch. You can pick up book one and the second book uh, on Amazon right now. These are the hard covers. They're pretty snazzy, if I do say so myself. I like the way they look. But you can also get paperback and you can even get ebook if you prefer. So check out We Were Wizards. That's my self published fantasy novel. It's on Amazon right now. I hope you enjoy. But we're not quite here to talk about Wizards, are we? No, no, no. We are here to talk about Marvel United Multiverse. And now that everything is kind of finalized from a Kickstarter campaign perspective, right? That box has been ticked. Uh, all the stuff that we are getting is 100% officially out there and we know what it is. And now it just becomes a waiting game. So with that being said, I thought it's high time I sat back and looked at everything Marvel United Multiverse is going to offer, and I did what YouTube does best, rank it. But of course, this game has tons of stuff to offer, so I don't want this video to reach the two and a half hour mark. What we're gonna do is we're going to split this up. This is gonna be a two-parter. Today, in part one, I will be ranking the game modes that will be present in Marvel United Multiverse, as well as the game boxes. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. In part two, next time, probably come out maybe early April, we will sit down and rank all the characters. Every character in the Multiverse campaign, I'm going to rank them. And I'm going to tell you how excited I am for each one. It's going to be bananas. I'm so excited. I've already got the list made up. It's ready to go. I just have to film it and get it ready and shiny and polished to present to all of you. But that's for future us to worry about. Right now, today is the present and we are going to rank the game modes and the game boxes. Hey, speaking of the future, it's me, Andrew from the future. You can tell I'm from the future because all of my hair is gone. Uh, so here's the deal. This video, when I finished putting it together and editing it and everything, ended up being quite a bit longer than I intended it to be. So I'm actually splitting the video up further. Right now, what you're about to watch is just ranking the new gameplay modes from Multiverse. Next time, in maybe a couple of weeks, we will release the ranking the boxes of the Multiverse. So what started off as a originally two-part thing ended up now becoming a three-part thing. It's confusing, I'm sorry, but right now you are just watching ranking gameplay modes. So whatever past Andrew is about to say with his slightly more luscious head of hair, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Let's begin with the game modes. So all this means is exactly what it sounds like. I'm going to be ranking, based on my level of excitement, the new gameplay modes that Andrea and the rest of the devs have prepared for us in Marvel United Multiverse. Uh, you know, what gets me stoked? What am I going to try first? What am I going to try last, if at all? And they added a lot. They did a lot of focusing on changing the way you play the game. So there's a fair amount to go through here. In fact, when I went through the campaign again to double check, it looks like we have 10. That's and this amount of new ways to customize our playthrough. So without further ado, let's count them down together. These are the 10 new game modes of MU Multiverse ranked in the order of how excited this guy is to give them a try. 
Starting off with number 10, the bottom of the list, the one I'm least excited for, that would be the complication cards. And the only reason that these are last, I mean, obviously something's got to be last, but the complications just seem to me like a small little thing you can just kind of toss in there to add a random spicy element to the game. The cards themselves are purple, and purple is always nice, but it's like they don't really look flashy or fancy. They're just a card with some text that says, hey, something bad happened. Go deal with it. And that doesn't necessarily sound bad to me. It just doesn't sound as exciting as the other nine things we're about to talk about. And considering how difficult a lot of the villains are already, and add to that how insanely difficult the upcoming villains sound like they're going to be, it feels like we're not going to need complication cards until we become like MU masters, right? Until everybody has had like a year to play through all this new stuff and, and then they can confidently sit down and be like, oh yeah, I can beat Abomination in five turns. Come at me. Then you can throw complications out there. But as it stands right now, they don't seem too interesting, at least to me. So that's why they're sitting at number 10. Number nine on my ranked list of new gameplay modes is going to be Pet Companions. I talked about this when we were covering the campaign together, about how I was a big fan of Simon's older game Arcadia Quest, and I loved how it was just a big influx of new characters and new fantasy stuff. Uh, and then they got to the point where the next big expansion that came out was Arcadia Quest Pets, and it really felt like they were jumping the shark. Sometimes literally, because I think one of the characters was a shark of some kind. And here in Marvel United, we do have a shark of some kind. The difference is, though, that um, they're not going all in on this, right? With Arcadia Quest, it was literally like season four of Arcadia Quest was Arcadia Quest Pets. Uh, and if Marvel had done that, I think there'd be rioting in the streets. So thankfully, they dialed back on the pet enthusiasm while still giving us the pets as a fun little mode. Now, adding them is going to be cool and interesting in certain cases, but it's really not going to be something I'm going to do often. When I use Kitty Pride, I'm curious to see how Lockheed works with that. Uh, and I will try the pets. I wouldn't have got them if they were a, a separate buy, like if they were something like the Playmat, I would not have gone in for them. But now that I'm going to have them, that they're part of the bundle, yeah, I'll give them a try. I'll see what's what. I mean, who would not want to play as Throg, right? Throg is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to just having this as a cute little optional mode. You know, if I have friends who come over with kids, they might enjoy this. But as it stands, the pets are not going to be hitting the table all that much. But I am happy to have them here. And coming in at number eight is going to be the Dark Carnage Challenge. This is ranked pretty low for me just because I'm comparing it in my head, at least, to the Deadpool Challenge, the the unicorn, I forget what the actual name for that is, but the Deadpool Unicorn Challenge is just what I'm going to call it. Because here's the thing, I've had the Deadpool box for almost a year, and I've never touched the Deadpool Unicorn Challenge. Uh, it's a fun random thing to add to your game, for sure, but the game to me is already fun just in its vanilla mode without adding this extra layer of zaniness on top of that. And the Carnage, uh, the Dark Carnage mode, rather, looks like it's kind of along the similar vein. It's like, hey, you're you're facing, you know, Corvus Glaive? Neat. Keep facing Corvus Glaive, but now Carnage is also going to show up and cause trouble. It's a little bit different in that, it, you know, based on what they said about him, he can become the main villain if you don't do something the right way. And of course it has that die, which is really interesting. So I'm curious about Dark Carnage. I will probably try it before I try the Deadpool Unicorn, but it's still not something that I see myself bringing to the table all that often. If anything, just for variety, I might use the Dark Carnage Mini once in a while when I end up facing Carnage as the main villain, just because that is a kick-ass sexy mini. But other than that, it's not something that gets me super stoked. Again, I'll try it once, see how I feel after, but when I'm cracking open Marvel United Multiverse next year, I'm not going to be jumping to that as my big exciting moment. The gameplay mode I ranked at number seven was the Civil War Registration Clash. We didn't get to see a gameplay example of this at least as far as I know. The Registration Clash was the asymmetrical one. I just realized how tricky it is to say Registration Clash out loud 
I'm going to get my voiceover students to say that as a warm up. Uh, but yeah, that registration clash is asymmetrical and it looks more complicated, more thematic, but more complicated than the other mode. So, you know, the blue team is running around trying to do this thing, but then the red team is trying to throw them in prison. I'm not a thousand percent clear on how that's going to work. If it's something where once I see the rules in action, would I rather be blue or red? You know, I really need to see more of it before I can make a better call. That's why I have it lower. Uh, I just, I feel like we haven't gotten to the meat of what Registration Clash is supposed to look and feel and play and sound and smell like. So I can't make a better judgment call than that. But the two Civil War Clashes are way cooler looking and way cooler sounding than I thought they would be when Civil War was initially announced. So that's why they made it a little bit higher because I'm just, I'm so impressed with what the devs were able to do with this box. That's also why the next thing on the list, number six, is the Civil War Hero Clash. This one is definitely more close to the blue versus gold team that we got in season two, except much more polished and, in my opinion, much more fun looking. Seeing that gameplay video of those two teams going head to head really made it look interesting. And when I think about how, you know, you could theoretically have eight people sitting around this board playing red team versus blue team in hero mode. Uh, that just sounds like a treat. Again, I play Marvel United solo 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, but the thought that now I can have eight people sitting around a board and playing this is really fascinating because it was just not that kind of game before. And yeah, it is more fun, in my opinion, to have everybody teaming up to, you know, smack down on like Bullseye or something. But when you have these two teams of heroes working together it creates this interesting dynamic that you don't see at the table very often. Usually when there's a, a, a team against a team in a game as thematic as this, one of them would be playing a villain and they would you would kind of get that, not role play, but you know, the, the, well, the players would get into it and the people playing the villain would be like, aha, we, we got you now, or evil, whatever. But the fact that everybody is playing a hero, it kind of forces you to at least mentally role play in a way that seems like it's super appropriate to what's going on in the comics. It feels like every team will consider themselves to be in the right, just like it was in the actual Civil War story. Me and my friends on Blue Team will be like, no, 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 we're doing this our way. We're doing this for freedom. We're not going to register, whatever. And the people on the red team are going to be like, no, you got to register. We, we don't mean to do this to you, but we got to take you in. Bye bang and then it just it's going to add a flavor to Marvel United that I didn't think was possible to exist in the already delicious aromatic stew that this game is. Again, I got to state, I will probably not play this very often because I always almost always play solo, but the fact that it exists, the possibilities of what people can do uh just in the terms of the the YouTube community and filming playthroughs. I'm just picturing, you know, big game groups filming their playthroughs of Civil War using a mishmash of characters from across the three seasons of this game to throw into Hero Clash. Oh, that sounds exciting. Sign me up. And now we come to my number five most anticipated gameplay feature of MU Multiverse, and that would be Commander Solo, which if I'm remembering right, I think that was Han Solo's call sign during like Return of the Jedi or something. No, he wasn't a commander. He was a captain. I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. As a solo player, of course, Commander Solo is going to get me excited. But why does it only get me number five on the list excited and not higher? And that's just because like a lot of people who solo through this game, I just I really like playing it multi-handed. Three heroes drawn randomly, and I play as if there are three players. I play multi-hand. I've tried the shield mode slash Xavier mode, and I like it in theory. Xavier mode sounded really cool in theory. In practice, it was not something I loved dearly. Um, when I've seen people like the Meeple Monkey play it on their channel, it looked decent, it looked fun, but it still, to me, is not as preferable as just multi-handing the damn thing, because that just makes it so much more fun, at least for me. So Commander Solo is not something that really has my blood pumping. However, I want you to remember this for a few months, because in one of our upcoming videos, I am going to try something bananas, and I have Commander Solo to thank for making that upcoming video a reality. We'll get there when we get there. Just remember this moment. We're going to take that journey together. 
I promise. But Commander Solo is sitting at number five. It, it looks like the ideal way to play solo without playing multi-handed. It looks like it's better than Xavier mode and shield mode. At least in theory. We'll see what it's like in practice. At number four on my list of most anticipated gameplay modes is going to be equipment cards. I've always liked small cards. Um, I play a lot of Gloomhaven and I just got Frosthaven, which took three years to get here. That's what this giant box is that you see behind me. That's where Frosthaven came in. It's massive. I think I pulled something when I opened the box. Anyway, it's full of tiny, not tiny, but small cards. And the equipment cards are going to be smaller as well. So I, I like that. And I also just really love the look of the equipment cards. They're so colorful. They're so bright. To me, just from a physical standpoint, they sum up what I love about Marvel United. I love how bright and colorful and vibrant this game is. Mm, the artwork, I could eat it up. It's so beautiful to look at. And it's not trying to be dark and dingy, like something like Massive Darkness, which I'm sorry, Simon, I didn't get into Massive Darkness because it looked like you were just trying to take Arcadia Quest and make it as if Chris Nolan had made it. And it's like, no, nah, what I liked about Arcadia Quest was the chibi look, was how cute and colorful it was uh, while still maintaining great gameplay. And then Massive Darkness came along and just kind of threw some gloom on top of that. So I like that Marvel United has this gorgeous art and that it translates so well to these equipment cards. I love how personalized they are for everybody, and yes, not everybody is getting one, but a lot of heroes are. And I am a guy who enjoys my double wilds. I'm not gonna lie, the double wilds have pulled my ass out of the fire pretty much every game I've ever played of this. So the idea of trading that in for equipment is going to be very thematic, but it is going to take some getting used to. But the thematicness of it all has me really stoked, and it's really gonna make it feel like Captain Carter is throwing that shield. It's really going to make me feel like, uh, whatchamacallit, Ghost Rider is zipping along on that motorcycle or in that car or whatever. It's really going to just add that layer of differentness to every hero, in particular, the season one heroes, because they do need it. We were all kind of positing back in like December, January, that they would add alternate cards to slip into the season one characters to kind of give them some more flavor like season two had. But this seems to have replaced that idea. And I think it's a really cool way to bring season one's folks up to the level of seasons two and three. So equipment cards, I'm really looking forward to getting those to the table once in a while. And come on, you've got, you've got Cap's Shield, you've got Mjolnir, you've got Stormbreaker, you've probably got other things that I'm forgetting. Uh, there's, there's so much fun to be had here. Now we're into the top three. Coming in at number three is going to be team cards. Frankly, the main thing that gets me so excited about team cards is there are so damn many of them. Once again, just like with equipment cards, they are beautiful to look at. They have the Marvel United art all over them and it's glorious. They're so colorful. They just add a new bit of context to something that I think a lot of us as players have been doing, which is saying, hey, you know, these four characters came in four different boxes, but they're known for being a team in the stories. So let's put them together as a team. And it doesn't affect anything in the game, but hey, now I have X factor or something. I, I'm just pulling a team out of the top of my head here. But then along comes team cards that says, well, what if it does affect something in the game? What if having a complete set of X-Factor characters or Guardians of the Galaxy characters as your team is going to affect the game thematically? What if they're actually going to behave like that team is known to behave? Warts and all. And the warts is important because all of the teams have a weakness. They all do. None of them fire on all cylinders. That's what makes Marvel Comics stories so interesting, as it's not just a bunch of people saying, yeah, good job, gang. We all get along and do our job perfectly. No, there's going to be trouble, even for the Fantastic Four, who are Marvel's first family, and they're supposed to love each other and be a unit. Even they have their problems. Namely, Human Torch is a dick. To translate that to the board, to not only say you are going to get these spicy new features that are going to make this team work, that are going to make Alpha Flight pop to life in a way they haven't before, but to also double down on that and say, yeah, but also Alpha Flight has their weaknesses and that's going to affect your game too. Brilliant. And 
we are getting what I think it's like I I forget the exact number, but there's at least 20 teams, right? That alone, if you just get the Marvel United shipment next year and literally from day one, you just say, okay, I'm going to try every team that the decks have provided for me. That's going to keep you busy for like three months. That's a lot of teams. The addition of this has me so excited and it has me so stoked to try these different combinations that I've been trying anyway and seeing what happens when you add the flavor and the context of these cards to it. And all of a sudden, to quote the great Carl Weathers, baby, you got a stew going. These team cards are glorious. I love them, but not as much as I love number two. Because number two is going to be, maybe to the surprise of some, I was going to say to the surprise of no one, but maybe to the surprise of some, my number two most anticipated gameplay feature is Sinister Six Assembled. Wow. Like, just wow. It was neck and neck. This and number one were pretty much neck and neck. When I get my hands on that, there's going to be drool coming out of this mouth. I hate to be gross, but that's I'm going to be so excited for this. I can't wait to try all the different combinations. Like I said in the last video that we made when we hit the, the Kickstarter and we, we made it, I'm finally going to get to recreate the Insidious Six from the cartoon. Because, yeah, we've got Mysterio and Dr. Octopus and Rhino, but now we finally got scorpion and chameleon and the shocker so the insidious six is going to be playable in a board game that i have i and i need to stress that as a kid who was unhealthily obsessed with that cartoon growing up and a kid who loved board games i'm pretty sure i have wanted a board game where i could face the insidious six since 1995 so the fact that i'm going to get to do that my inner child and hell my outer child they're jumping for joy and then to top that off, there is, you know, the idea of just throwing in these other characters that you wouldn't even think of. Like, let's put Spot in the Sinister Six. Why not? Let's put Carnage. Carnage, has he's not a team player, but let's put him in Sinister Six and see what happens. And if we do get a season four, there are still Spider-Man characters to be sprinkled in. They're probably going to get their own Sinister Six assembled options as well, which means in the future we could see characters like Mr. Negative and Swarm join the roster. And that, to me, is glorious. So Sinister Six Assembled is my number two most anticipated, which leaves my number one most anticipated gameplay mode for Marvel United Multiverse. It has to be the campaign cards. They were so close, guys. They're, I can't stress enough how close these two were. Sinister Six Assembled literally almost crawled up to the first place mode just now because talking about it made me excited. But Campaign Mode wins by a hair's breadth for me because it adds something that I don't think the game had, at least outside of my own head, which is context. It adds a reason for you to be facing who you're facing with who you're facing. And even though random is my preferred way to play, the idea of throwing in a little bit of a story mode without going overboard, like something like Frosthaven, where I'm sitting there doing math for 20 minutes, the idea of Marvel United taking control of a narrative, letting you choose whether you want to go down that path or not, that sounds so fun. And just like Sinister Six Assembled, I feel like future seasons will benefit and just add more. See, the thing about the team cards is, as much as I love the idea of the team cards, I think we've covered all the teams. I'm probably wrong. I don't know comics, but I'm sure there's teams I'm forgetting, but there are so many team cards that I think we've covered pretty much everybody. If a season four comes along, it could add some new characters to those teams, but in terms of adding new teams we don't have yet, I think we're good. I think we got them all. When it comes to campaigns, what have they given us? Like eight campaign stories? How many Marvel comic stories are there? Try like 8 million. So the fact that we only have these campaigns that are in this box, it tells me that there's so much more that we could pile onto this. Like the possibilities for this, just like Sinister Six Assembled, it can grow. This is something like how the addition of the anti-heroes in season two was so exciting to me because it feels like, okay, moving forward in future seasons, this is only going to expand more. We're only going to get more anti-heroes. That's how I feel about campaign decks. Yes, it's fun that we can now get the Civil War deck and the Maximum Carnage deck and all that, but there are other stories 
in the comics that we have yet to explore and we will probably get a chance to now. And people who know comics better than I do will probably come up with tons of lists for stories that they would love to see represented in these cards. And I would love to join in that fun and, and speculate, but until I kind of get my hands on the campaign cards and see exactly how they work, I think it'll be hard for me to make my own. But just as it stands, the campaign mode shows so much promise. It's definitely something I'm going to be trying. And I just, I can't wait to see what it adds to the future of Marvel United. For all we know, the Spider-Geddon box might even come with its own Spider-Geddon campaign deck, because I think they struck gold with this mode. So there it is, that's my ranked list of my most anticipated gameplay modes. Now, for the second half of this video, let's talk about boxes. Okay, future Andrew back again. So that is the end of part one of this ranking trilogy, what ended up being a trilogy. That was ranking the gameplay modes. Next time, we're going to rank the boxes. Every expansion, every box that is coming in Marvel United Multiverse. Stay tuned for that real soon. Until next time, let's wait together for whatever happens next in the Master Plan.